Hello everyone, my name is Riley Dickens and I'm a consultant with Encryption Consulting and today I'll be talking to you about our product, CodeSign Secure 3.0. So today's video will be cut into two parts. The first part will focus on who we, Encryption Consulting, are, the different challenges and risks that you face with code signing, why you should code sign, and a short introduction to what code signing is. Along with that, we'll also talk about some of the recent code signing attacks that have happened in the past eight or so years. So the second half of the video will be about our product itself, CodeSign Secure. We'll take a high level look at the architecture of CodeSign Secure. We'll take a look at the two different options we have available, client side hashing and server side hashing. And we'll also take a look at the different features that we support. So let's first take a look at who we are. So encryption consulting is a strategic partner with many of the leading encryption technology providers. We have about 30 plus clients in the Fortune 100 and 500 categories, and all of our consultants have big four consulting experience. At Encryption Consulting, we focus on four different pillars when working with an enterprise. And the first one is data classification, identification, and discovery. In this pillar, we focus on finding all the sensitive information within your organization, ensuring that it's encrypted, and if it's not, we figure out the best way to do that. The second pillar is where we put these controls in place. This is the data protection controls pillar. And here we focus on enforcing best practices for data protection controls like PKI, certificate lifecycle management, code signing, etc. For the third pillar, we go through expert recommendations from our consultants on what we think you should do for your enterprise and we work to mold this plan and this roadmap to your organization exactly how you want it. Now our final pillar is the deployment and implementation and this is where we work with your organization and as hands-on or hands-off as you prefer and help you put this solution into your enterprise. So now that you know who we are, let's take a look at code signing. So this is a very high level look at what code signing is. Now code signing is the process of digitally signing executables, scripts, firmware upgrades, really anything with code to confirm the author's identity and provide assurance that the code hasn't been altered in transit. Now this is a very basic understanding of how code signing works, but it'll help you get a better idea of how it works. So what happens is the software publisher will decide that they want to sign code. So they'll create something called a Certificate Signing Request, or CSR. Now CSR generates a public and private key pair. And from this key pair, the public key, along with the Certificate Signing Request, is sent along to the Certificate Authority. Now the Certificate Authority verifies the identity of the publisher, authenticates the publisher's digitally signed certificate request, and then bundles up the identity of the publisher along with their public key. That bundle is then signed by the certificate authority and sent along as a code signing certificate. Now that the publisher has that code signing certificate, they're ready to sign code. Now we'll take a more detailed look at how code signing works. So like I mentioned before, you first create the code signing request, which generates a public and private key. Now after that, a hash of the code is produced. This is called a hash digest, and this is done by passing the code through a hashing algorithm. Now, the hash digest is extremely important to the process of code signing because when you create a hash digest, that is the only version of that digest that is available. What I mean by that is if you change one letter in a piece of code, the hash that comes out of that hashing algorithm is completely different from the original. So the only way to reproduce the original hash digest is by using the exact same code. So this means if there is something like a man in the middle attack where the code is taken in transit, edited, and sent on to the recipient, they'll know right away that the hashes don't match and that the code has been changed in transit, and so now they know I shouldn't use this code. Now after the hash is created, the hash is passed through a signing algorithm, and the publisher's private key is used as an input, and so this is where the hash is signed. Information about the publisher and the CA is taken from the code signing certificate and bundled in with that, with that signature. Information about the publisher and the CA is drawn from the code signing certificate 
and incorporated into the signature. So now the original code, the signature, and the code signing certificate are bundled together with the public key. And the public key is there to verify the authenticity of the code once it gets the recipient. The code's now ready for distribution and has been officially signed and can be sent on to the recipient. So now that we know how code signing works, let's take a look at why you should code sign. So one of the biggest reasons for code signing is the establishment of trust in an application or update. So what I mean by this is if you take a look at these two images here, on the left you have an example of code that has been sent on to a recipient but that isn't code signed. As you can see it's got the bright yellow warning sign and if your computer sees that they're saying okay I don't know who this publisher is so I cannot tell you that this is safe to download. So you see this and you say, okay, I don't know if I can trust them. My computer doesn't know if I can trust them. So why should I trust them? And you most likely won't download that code. Now on the other side, you have code sign code. And as you can see, they say they know who the publisher is because it's in their trusted certificate store. And the operating system says, I know who created this code, so it's safe to use. And so now you can safely download the code without any fear of malware being within it. Now another reason you should code sign is it opens the doors to application stores and what I mean is big stores like the Google Play Store or the Apple iOS Store, they really want their developers to use code signing because it creates trust with the developer along with the store itself when a recipient sees that this is safe to be downloaded. Another reason to code sign is that there, it provides a means to detect any alterations of code. So like I mentioned earlier, if that hash is changed in any way, you know that that code has been altered and you know not to use it. Additionally, it reduces the risk of identity theft or damage to a reputation of an organization. So without code signing certificates, an organization might say, I'm the Microsoft Corporation, but then another threat actor might also say, I'm the Microsoft Corporation. Well, without that code signing certificate, neither of them can prove it. But if the Microsoft Corporation has their code signing certificate, you know, okay, this is the actual Microsoft Corporation and you can trust their code. Now, the final reason that you should code sign is the biggest reason that code signing is done, and that's validation of the application author as well as the integrity of the application itself. So now that you know why you should code sign, let's move on to some of the challenges that you face with code signing. So these aren't all of the challenges you'll face when you code sign, but these are some of the biggest ones that we see with different enterprises. Now the first one is controlling signing operations and processes. And what I mean by this is security of keys. Now keys are extremely important. You'll see in some of the code signing attacks later on how having weak key security causes a huge issue within an organization. Things like no audit trail or visibility into signing operations, those also cause a lot of issues because without that, you can't track what happened with a key, where it got stolen, if it got stolen. So you really need that visibility into signing operations. Now, the second challenge you can face with code signing is signing events and a lack of centralized control of those signing events and audits. So what I mean is sometimes you'll see an organization who doesn't track signing events at all. And that's a big issue because if you have a breach, you need to figure out what happened and who let them get through the workflow to put out their code. Now, some organizations will sign code, but they won't have it centrally recorded. So that means they have to dig through eight different databases and they have to look for an hour when all they need is one log. Instead, with it centrally managed, you can look at everything at once and find right away what you need and audit that trail. Now, going along with this as well is the approval or the workflow and enter the enterprise workflow management. And what I mean by this is having approvers along the way who are saying, okay, this code certificate, it, this code signing certificate is from so and so. And they're saying, okay, you sent this to me. Is this actually you sending this to me? They'll say yes and they'll approve it and it'll move on through the chain and eventually sign code. Now, the final challenge you'll face with code signing is validation of the signing process when you have a globally distributed team. So with most organizations, development teams are spread all across the globe 
and this causes something called key sprawl. So each development team needs to sign their code and each development team has their own key. So this becomes a big issue because it's really hard to manage a thousand keys within an organization that are all over the world. And you don't really get that visibility into the signing operations we talked about earlier. So now that you know the challenges that are faced with code signing, let's take a look at some of the risks associated with not code signing. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest risks is improper storage of crypto materials, which is relating to keys for the most part. Now software stored keys are a way to store keys, but they're extremely vulnerable to compromise compared to things like hardware security modules, which offer a great way to keep your keys safe and secure. So storing keys in hardware, like hardware security modules, isn't just best practice, it's also mandated in some cases. And there's certain standards and regulations that are put in place to give organizations peace of mind. Now, the second risk you might face with code signing is forged updates. And what I mean by this is someone may get into your network and create a piece of malicious software or firmware that gets improperly trusted. And this is where that enterprise workflow management comes in again. Without proper segregation of duties and approvers, you really run into issues because anyone can come into your network, create a code signing certificate, and just pass it on down the line and send the malware through to all these victims. Now, one more issue you may face, one more risk you may face with code signing is ad hoc processes and how much they really do add to the risk of code signing. So if all these processes are ad hoc, it causes a big issue because you can't track through the different audit trails to find what happened with this key. Now again, this comes back to enterprise workflow management. With proper approvals, you can find who let certain things through and figure out where this code signing certificate came from in the first place. So now that we've seen the risks, let's take a look at some of the most recent code signing attacks. So as you can see, over the past eight years or so, there's been a number of different code signing attacks. And I won't go into each one, but I do want to talk about a few specific ones. And that's starting with D-Link and Asus. Now, these two companies had very similar attacks happen to them, where a key was stolen that was improperly stored, and the threat actor was able to use that key to create a legitimate code signing certificate, create code within an update that had malware in it, and send it along to victims. Now, this caused a huge issue because, obviously, you need to have proper storage of keys, and if they'd use a, something like a hardware security module, they wouldn't have had this issue. Now, the Adobe attack in 2013 had hardware security modules, but what they didn't have was proper workflow enterprise management. So what I mean is they had their keys protected, but someone was able to get within their network, create a code signing certificate, make code with malware in it, and send it along. And there were no approvers along the way to say, hmm, this doesn't seem right, I don't know who this is, or to verify with the person and say, hey, did you send this code through? Instead, the code just went through and infected thousands of users. Now, we've seen a few of these. Now let's talk about one of the most recent ones, the Kasai VSA attack. Much like Asus and D-Link, Kasai VSA had a very similar attack where, with their improper management of keys. So Kasai is a software company that uses software like Kasai VSA that provisions agents at different endpoints that they are installed on and those agents are then allowed to make changes to files, things like that, pretty high level admin uh, control. And part of these endpoints was that they could, put, they could put firmware updates in right away once it came to them automatically. Now, Kasai VSA was attacked at each of these endpoints by these threat actors and what they did was they wrote a file into the endpoints working directory ran a script that turned off any antivirus systems, and then they turned that file that they wrote into the working directory into an executable and ran it. And that executable had malware on it. Now, one of the issues that the threat actors ran into was that to run a binary, the attackers had to have a legitimately signed piece of code. And once Kasaya found out about the attack, they traced it back through the different audit trails and found what happened. And they found that the attackers 
had taken a legitimate key from a legitimate company, created a code signing certificate with that company's name, and created this forged malware update and sent it along to all these victims. Now, if they had not only used hardware security modules, but also had proper approvals in place, this issue would never have happened. So proper management and transparency into your code signing is extremely important. So that's all for this video. Next video, we'll talk more about our tool, CodeSign Secure, that can handle all of these different issues, including proper management of keys and transparency into your code signing operations. Thank you.